Hello and welcome to this mini gem brought to you by the Association for Elderly Medicine Education. My name's Emma Fiskin and this mini gem is entitled Ironing Out the Kinks in Iron Studies. So our learning outcomes are a quick reminder of iron physiology, what tests are included in iron studies, when should we be ordering these tests and interpretation of the results. So we're going to start with a quick overview of iron physiology. With a healthy balanced diet, your oral iron intake will be 10 to 20 milligrams daily. Foods that are high in iron are animal-based products such as red meat, leafy green vegetables such as spinach, and pulses like lentils. Only 10% of this is absorbed, and the main sites of absorption are in the duodenum and proximal jejunum. Once inside the intestinal intracyte, ferritin is either used for intracellular processes or it's transferred out of the cell attached to transferrin. Most of the iron, approximately 75%, goes into erythropoiesis in the bone marrow. 10-20% to 20 gets transported to the liver where it's stored as ferritin and it can also be transported to the muscle as myoglobin. But what test should you actually order if your consultant asks you to do some iron studies? So firstly, ferritin. As we've already said, it's an intracellular iron storage protein. Um, Perhaps more importantly, it's also an acute phase protein, so it means it can be increased in inflammation, liver disease, and malignancy. Normal range is 15 to 200 in premenopausal women and 20 to 300 in men and postmenopausal women. Secondly, serum iron is ferric ions that are bound to transferrin. The normal range is 10 to 30, and it can be affected by dietary intake, inflammation, and infection. Transferrin is the transporter protein that carries iron around the body. It's increase in iron deficiency. This is to maximise the use of available iron. Next is total iron binding capacity. That's an alternative to transferrin. It represents the availability of iron binding sites on transferrin. It increases in iron deficiency and falls in iron overload. And finally, transferrin saturations. This is calculated by looking at serum iron and either transferrin or total iron binding capacity. Usually, transferrin is 30% saturated with iron, with a range of roughly 25 to 45%. It's increase in iron overload and falls in iron deficiency. So, when would you order iron studies? To in order to investigate suspected iron deficiency, iron overload, or response to medical treatment. And you can take a couple of minutes um, to read about the specific causes on this slide. On to the interpretation of the results. I'm going to mainly concentrate on iron deficiency as we see that commonly in our patient population. So you think it would be fairly straightforward. Iron overload would result in high ferritin and transferrin saturation. And iron deficiency would result with a low ferritin. And this usually is the case. However, it can be more challenging. As mentioned before, ferritin is an acute phase protein, so levels can be raised in inflammation, and that may, may mask iron deficiency. So uh, you may have a patient who's iron deficient but comes in with an intercurrent illness such as a pneumonia, and their ferritin levels are raised in the response to that inflammation. Oral iron can also alter the results, and acute liver dysfunction can mimic iron overload. So it's probably a good idea just to recap the World Health Organization definition of anemia, which is less than 120 hemoglobin for non-pregnant females, less than 100 for pregnant females, and less than 130 for men. And in terms of iron deficiency, a ferritin of less than 15, or transferrin saturations less than 16%, or hemoglobin rise of 1 gram per deciliter after 2 months of supplementation. There is general consensus that if the ferritin is less than 15, you are iron deficient. And likewise, if your ferritin is over 100, you are more than likely iron replete. However, there is a grey area in between. Patients with chronic inflammatory conditions may have raised levels of ferritin, which are reflecting the systemic inflammation that's occurring. In these people, ferritin can appear either falsely high or normal, when in reality, stores may be low. Expert opinion varies as to the level of ferritin which would be diagnostic of iron deficiency anemia in patients with chronic inflammatory conditions. The British Society of Gastroenterology, in their guidelines for the management of iron deficiency anemia, suggest that a ferritin of 50 or less may still be consistent with iron deficiency if there is coexistent inflammatory disease. And other groups have suggested that unless your ferritin is 70 or above, 
iron deficiency cannot be reliably ruled out in these patients. This table summarises iron study results in different clinical scenarios and we will concentrate on iron deficiency and anemia of chronic disease as these are two commonly encountered conditions and can cause confusion. Anemia of chronic disease is a common syndrome that can be found in patients with autoimmune disorders, chronic infections and inflammatory conditions. Inflammation stops the body utilising the iron stores. We know that ferritin may not be useful in the presence of infection and inflammation, therefore not making it useful in differentiating between iron deficiency and anemia of chronic disease. One thing that you can look at is the total iron binding capacity. This will be raised in iron deficiency and reduced in anemia of chronic disease. So what is going to help us with interpreting the results in these difficult cases? Firstly, wait four weeks after stopping iron supplements before testing iron studies. Secondly, be careful interpreting iron studies in those patients who are acutely unwell with an inflammatory illness. It may be worthwhile repeating them once they've recovered to get a clearer picture. If you're not sure whether the ferritin result is being affected by inflammation, look for other markers of inflammation, for example CRP, white blood cells and platelets. Thirdly, look at the patient as a whole. Look at the trend of their HB and the MCV as well as the iron study results and the past medical history and intercurrent illness. Usually with an iron deficiency anemia, you would get a microcytic picture. However, just be slightly careful because there can be instances of a falsely normal MCV when a patient has dual pathology. For example, a patient with iron deficiency but also on a medication that causes a macrocytosis like methotrexate. Finally, look at the total iron binding capacity. This is raised in iron deficiency anemia. There's not much iron in the body, so the capacity for binding iron increases. We've come to the end of this mini gem, and just to recap our learning outcomes, we've looked at iron physiology, what tests are included in iron studies, and some of the challenges of interpretation. We know that when your ferritin is less than 15, you're iron deficient, and if your ferritin is more than 100, you're more than likely iron replete. We've acknowledged there's a grey area in between and hopefully we've given you some top tips to help interpretation in these cases. References are on the following slide and thank you very much for listening.